Hello again. Today we're on the bench with quite a number of goodies. Specifically, these are tools used to make budget measurements of VSWR and return loss for antennas at 5.8 gigahertz, which is outside of the range that cheap VNAs or SNAs can usually cover. So, without further ado, let's get into it. The two main devices we're going to be talking about here are a directional coupler and an RF power meter, both that are capable of operating at 5.8 gigahertz. So first, the directional coupler. This is a directional coupler that I bought on eBay from some guy in New Jersey. It's made by a company, Narda. It can operate between 2 and 8.6 gigahertz. It is a 50 watt power rating, and its coupled output is 16 dB down from the RF power going into the input there. A directional coupler is a device that measures RF power in only one direction. Specifically, power going from the left, the input here, to the right, the output. And it measures that power by coupling a 16 dB down RF power output right here. Now, if you use this in forward operation like that, then you can use it to get an indication of how much power is flowing through the device. But if you use it in the reverse direction, that input then shows you reflected power. So if you connect an RF input to the output here and an antenna to the, out to the input port, which is now your output, that 16 dB down measurement will be an indication of how much power is reflected. If you connect nothing to the output, then you have perfect reflection. So your reflected power is equal to your input power and you get a 16 dB down indication of what the reflected power is. From the difference between that reference measurement of total reflection and some reflection from an antenna or a load connected, you can then do subtraction and you get the return loss. Return loss is mathematically equivalent to VSWR, so we can just throw it into the right formula and convert it. Now, in order to use the directional coupler, we're going to need an RF power meter and a signal source. The signal source that we're going to be using today is a Boscam FPV transmitter. This is one of the really old ones with only eight channels. It's 200 milliwatts. It's got this big heat sink here. It's got efficiency that's like less than 20%. It draws about 0.1 amps at 12 volts. So it's a 200 milliwatt output, and I have it on Boscam channel A4, which is 5808 megahertz. And then I'm also going to want variable power levels out of this, so I have these three 2 watt 15 dB attenuators. For our stimulus powers that we're going to be using for various measurements today, we'll use different combinations of these attenuators, and we'll be making measurements out of this 16 dB port right here. We'll be making those measurements with this RF power meter board. This was sourced from eBay also, and it shipped from China, so it took a very long time to get here in the United States. And it didn't come with a very good spec sheet, but it did have the eBay advertisement and some specs on the board. So I'll summarize all of that for you right now. On the board, it says that it's good for 1 to 8,000 megahertz, and it has a gain of minus 25 millivolts per decibel. On the eBay ad, it said that it has a dynamic range of 70 dB and can measure RF powers from minus 65 dBm to plus 5 dBm. It also said that it's a logarithmic detector with a linear output between 0.5 volts and 2.1 volts. And I plugged in the device with no RF power on the input, and I instantly measured 2.4 volts. This worried me greatly, and I decided that I wasn't going to just trust things I could find online about this device, or most of the things in the eBay ad. Now, in the words of Rick Sanchez, I will have to take for granted that the RF power is acceptable between minus 65 dBm and plus 5 dBm, but I'll try to say under 0 dBm, just for safety. So, knowing that about this device, we're going to have to characterize its output voltage as proportional to the input RF power. And we're going to want to also check that for linearity. To do that, we're going to put in three separate RF powers. And we're going to take the lower two and make a line of best fit. And then we're going to use the third point as a test case to see how linear the device is over its whole range and if our line of best fit is close to the RF power that we claim we're putting in with the third measurement. So to do that, we have the three sets of attenuators and the transmitter and the directional coupler. Now, when we're going to be calibrating this device, we're going to want to use it in situ. So we'll connect it to the 16 dB coupled port right here. And then we'll use the directional coupler in forward mode to make measurements of the power going through it, for the calibration at least. And we'll connect a dummy load on the output just not have to worry about reflections. This is a DC to 6 gigahertz 50 ohm dummy load rated for 10 watts. We'll use that. And then on the input, we'll connect this with various levels of attenuation. So 200 milliwatts is plus 23 dBm. 16 dB down from that is plus 7 dBm, which is still too high, so we're going to have to use at least one attenuator all the time to be within the acceptable input range for that board. 
Using three attenuators, each 15 dB, the power will be minus 38 dBm. Using two, it'll be minus 23 dBm. And using one, it will be minus 8 dBm. So we'll be performing our calibration using the minus 38 and the minus 23 dBm points. And then we'll be checking on the minus 8 dBm points. Then for our actual stimulus for our return loss measurements, we'll use the minus 23 dBm stimulus, which means that our return loss power will be below that and likely within 10, 15, 20 dB down from it. So it'll likely be within where our line of best fit is. So anyhow, that's a summary of the tools we're going to use and how we're going to use them. Let's get into characterizing the device, looking at the characterization, making our measurements, and then assessing what those measurements mean. All right, so we'll begin with characterizing the device here. I have the transmitter connected with the three attenuators and plugged in, and we're measuring 1.716 volts. Continuing here is only with two of the attenuators. We measure 1.338 volts. And now here we have only one attenuator connected. We're measuring 0.947 volts. All right, so we're inside the thinking space heater here. And let's take a look at our calibration data. Here's our three data points. Stimulus minus 38, minus 23, and plus 8 dBm. Measurements 1.716, 1.338, and 0.947 volts. Using the first two of these points right here, I make a line of best fit. And that line of best fit is most valid from minus 38 to minus 23 dBm. Then I'm also checking for linearity using the third point here. So I made a calculator using the slope intercept form, you know, mx plus b from algebra 1. And then if we put in 1.716, we get minus 38. 1.338, we get one, uh, minus 23 dBm. And 0.947, minus 7.48 dBm. So that's close to minus 8 dBm. So up at the tippy top of the measurement range, it's still behaving pretty linear. Good to know. For our stimulus for the actual measurements, we're going to be using a minus 23 dBm stimulus. So when there's return loss and the actual power is less than minus 23 dBm, we're closer to that range where we've actually made our lineup as fit for the calibration. Again, this will be done at 5.805 gigahertz. And now we have everything we need to go ahead and start measuring our return loss. So we'll go ahead and do that, and then we'll discuss the results. OK, so with the device characterized, we can go ahead and get to our forward power measurement. So here we can see a reading of 1.3. 39 volts. So we'll write that down. That corresponds to a power of minus 23 dBm, so that's exactly what we expect it should be. Then we'll start with our first measurement, and we'll start with the DC to 6 gigahertz dummy load rated for 10 watts. So 50 ohm dummy load should be basically a perfect matching here. And we're measuring 1.909 1 volts. And now we'll measure serial number 5, my five turn RHCP helical antenna for 5.8 gigahertz. We can see 1.739 volts. And now the stock cloverleaf that came with the Fat Shark Attitude V5s, 1.649, 1.65 volts. Now one of my first helical antennas, made this a long time ago, far lower quality than some of the other stuff. 1.656 volts. Now a iFlight Pagoda RHCP. One of these mini guys. I'll try to get it held up right. 1.491 volts. Next we'll measure a red Foxier Pagoda antenna. 1.581 volts. And now another RHCP Pagoda from Foxier. We measure 1.5 five five eight volts now an oldie but a goodie a skew planar wheel 1.844 volts 1.844 volts interesting one 15 db attenuator 1.831 volts a 2.4 gigahertz left hand circularly polarized clover 1.46 1.472 volts the log spiral antenna from the video on the Nano VNA V2 first measurements, 1.757 volts. So I've made this table below of all the measurement results, and I've color-coded the final results based on how good they are. Uh, anything that was VSWR 1.5 or less is colored green. Anything that's 1.5 to 2.2 is colored yellow, and anything above 2.2 is colored red. I went to 2.2 because one of these Foxier Pagodas didn't perform so hot at the center frequency, and it doesn't deserve to be read. That antenna works pretty well in real-life applications. 
and practically just anything below 2 is probably fine for most receive applications. Transmit it matters more because the reflected power, the actual magnitudes are larger and you can possibly damage equipment with that. But on receive only, it's not such a big issue. So we'll discuss these in terms of how well the results turned out. First, you can see they all have the same input power measurement, the 1.339 volts, which corresponds to a power that's round about minus 23 dBm, the stimulus that we were intending. So first, the antennas that performed poorly. The 2.4 gigahertz LHCP Clover is not designed for 5.8 gigahertz, so of course it performs poorly. Return loss of 5.28 dB and VSWR above three. Also, the iFlight RHCP Pagoda did not do so hot with a return loss of around 6 dB and VSWR is still around 3. Moving into the middle range performance category, we have the Fox Ear Pagoda, the Fat Shark Patch Antenna that came stock with the Attitude V5s, the Fat Shark Clover that came stock with the Attitude V5s, and the Fox Ear Pagoda Red. Now just because their VSWR isn't perfect doesn't mean that these Pagodas aren't awesome because of their axial ratio, their ability to maintain polarization, and their, their pattern being so highly concentrated at low elevation angles, so they're very good for getting distance as long as you're flying low, which is a typical use case for many of these model aircraft. Then we get into the stuff that performed exceptionally well in terms of VSWR. The dummy load, of course, was probably going to be the most well-matched thing here. That had a return loss 22.65 dB, VSWR 1.16, so very good matching there. The five-turn helical, RHCP serial number five, the one I usually fly on my goggles, VSWR 1.38. I built that myself, and that's a uh, very good VSWR, and it gets very good performance in the real world. Interesting to see actual measurements confirm just how good a design it is. Now, granted, that is for center frequency 5.805 gigahertz, which I designed these antennas, or put in the design specs, for exactly 5,800 megahertz. So we expect the best performance to be there. That's not... I haven't tested it over the rest of the 5.8 gigahertz band, but for, right there on channel A4, great performance. The skew planar wheel. This is an old antenna that I've had for a long time. It's been very beat up. I usually used it on the receiver downlink side, and that one is very well matched, VSWR 1.22. So that's a great performer. The 15 dB attenuator was a kind of uh, fun measurement that I threw in there. Remember, even though there's a short circuit at the end of the attenuator and power is still reflected, that power gets attenuated as it goes to the short circuit and gets attenuated as it's reflected from the short circuit. So we see slightly more than 15 dB attenuation as would happen if you traveled through it one way and uh, good matching there. So very cool. And then the log spiral that was measured in the Nanovania V2 first measurements video, that one performs pretty well too, VSWR 1.34. So it might actually be interesting to try this out for use as a directional FPV antenna. It'll have about half the gain of this uh, helical, but could be interesting. It's kind of large though. So that's about all I have for this video. It's This has been the how to make cheap VSWR and return loss measurements at 5.8 gigahertz video. If you like this content, please consider hitting that thumbs up button or subscribing for more.